Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutare Swayam Rupa Karamayam Dharati Swabharantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamanam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Sa Sri Rupam Sagaram Sahagana Raghunatam Bhitam Samsadevam Sadvaitam Sabadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Rahidam Sri Radha Krishna Paran Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishikan Bhitam Stam Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pasaya Bhutale Shimadi Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinuman Misti Sari Sadi Devi Gurvani Pachari Nirvish Sony Vari Paskada De Sarhari Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadhar Shiva Sri Guru Bhakti Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Welcome to Wisdom Wednesday emanating from Spanish Borg, Utah. Our AM radio station has been off the air for about two weeks now. I've always having extensive renovations done to the radio station building. And with all the work that's being done, the wires are always getting cut, disturbed. We had our engineer out almost every other day for a while. And now we've just thrown up our hands in despair. It's not going to end until the construction's over. So for those of you who listen to the radio station through Wi-Fi in different parts of the world, we have to apologize for you, but that's that's the explanation. We were literally bringing the engineer out every 48 hours. But some other, every single phase of the construction seems to have knocked the radio station off the air. I thought we had it on the air and I went back down there yesterday afternoon to monitor some of the programming and it's dead again. I don't know. They were doing uh, siding on the outside. So they must have cut the phone wires or something. Anyway, that's the state of the radio station, which is that is temporarily dead in the water sometime in the future we'll get it back in the air so apologize to those who depend upon it as their life blood living in remote areas but um, there's no sense in throwing ourselves against the wall until the construction is over so there are many references particularly in the next devotion about how one simple devotional act like smelling tulsi or hearing the names of the lord or taking brashadam um, triggers recollection of one's devotional service in a past life. You read some of these the statements that said, you know, somebody just took a, a, a morsel of rice on their tongue and they became enlightened. And you think, yeah, right. You know, I've, you think for yourself, I've been eating sanctified rice for 50 years, <laughs> Prashadam, from the altar of Vrindavan and Mayapur and Jagannath Puri and Tirupati and Udupi and Spanish Fork and Salt Lake City and New Jersey and Miami. And how, how is it that this person just w took one grain of rice and went back to home, back to God? It doesn't seem fair. <laughs> so you may think, you know, based on our, the fallen condition of most people, that these statements are hyperbole, they're exaggeration, are just meant to kind of pump you up. But the fact is they're not over-exaggerations, they're understatements. Those who are pure devotees would say these are not inflated statements, this is not hyperbole, this is not exaggeration, this is understatement. The fact is that we don't know what our previous lives have consisted in. So look at the story before us. Now, now we're on the episode 142, the like Gajendra Leela. You 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 wouldn't imagine in your in your furthest dreams that a, that an elephant who'd been living on the heavenly planet for a thousand years had many wives had children, grandchildren, had dominated all the elephants, um, had a habit of getting drunk on Saturday nights and going and sporting the water with his wife. Who would imagine that he had been 99% Krishna conscious in his past life? And who would imagine that being grabbed 
by a crocodile would trigger his eternal Krishna consciousness. Most people would have the opposite effect. They would scream and yell. And whatever equanimity they might have had would be gone in the click of a finger. They'd be totally hysterical. They'd lose it. You see people walking along the street and there's a, somebody inside of a tree and that makes a move towards them and they jump and they swear, hold their hearts. People are not, people are ill prepared for sudden reversals, for attacks. Hidden, Gajendra's in the water. He didn't see it coming. Crocodiles stealthily approached him in a way that was invisible, was not visible to him. And they hit him. You imagine the shock of that crocodile coming at a high speed and Gajendra hitting the leg of that elephant. The trauma. A million out of a million people would totally lose it. Tip over into hysteria. And... Uh, after an initial period of adjustment and orientation, the actually opposite happened to Gajendra. He recalled prayers echoed from the past, weathering the storm. <clears throat> His prayers echoed weathering the storm, mantras resurfacing from the past, transcendental sound awakening memories profound. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhu Kavanai Shravanadi Chudi Kriya. Prabhupada used to tell us over and over again that Krishna consciousness is not something external. It isn't anything that we find or look for here and there over hill and dale. Krishna consciousness is in inherent. It's innate. All we have to do is uncover it. It's ours. It's nothing that we've, we've lost and we have to find. It's rather within us. We've covered it. So we just have to uncover it. And that's why we're given by Krishna himself in the form of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu the Maha Mantra as the specific prescription for this age of awakening and covering our original Krishna conscious. And depending on the history of your past life, it might only take one recitation. We read about King Kadbanga. King Kadbanga was uh, fighting for the demigods and they, they gave him, a, after the fight was over, they gave him a boon. His only request was, let me know how much more time I have left. Because he, he thought that more than gold, more than jewels, more than land, more than kingdoms, time is our most valuable asset. You can't buy back a moment of time with all the money in the world. So he wanted to know how much money is in the bank? How much time do I have? How many assets do I have? He happened to have been told that your life is over. When the Demigods looked into his future, they didn't see any future for him in this life. So he immediately, within a second, reverted to Krishna consciousness from being involved in fighting and passion and bloodletting and attacking and counterattacking, thrust and parry, de deflecting weapons and javelins and arrows and swords to inflicting uh, pain with weapons and javelins and arrows and swords. Um, uh, from being totally absorbed in all these martial considerations, King Kadvanga switched in a moment to full Krishna consciousness and went back to home, back to God. Those who are practitioners of bhakti sincerely would say these are not overstatements. These are understatements. Look at Ajahn Myo. He, for... 65 years, he did nothing but sin. Took up with a common law wife who used to be a prostitute. Fa fathered many children, 12 children by her. Supported them with committing crimes. Who would imagine that Ajamil on his deathbed would chant the name of his youngest son, Narayan, Narayan, and get, uh, get freedom from all of his sinful life? Who would imagine? The Kumaras. Kumaras were... Hardcore and personless, fixed in Brahman realization, looked at the devotees with rolled eyes and upturned eyebrows. And yet it said, Tashara Vindanaya Nasha Parada Kanjaka Talashi Makaran Antagata Shavirasha Shankshava Makshara Chitanva. Just when the aroma of the Tosi mixed with the musk from the lotus feet of the Lord entered their nostrils. They had a complete change of heart. 
from they left aside their impersonalistic practices and tendencies and beliefs and became devotees, just like nah. So these various statements about quick turnarounds, turning around from impersonalism on a dime, turning around from sinful life on a dime, turning around from sensuality on a dime, happened many times. Mahavogyana Tapasha. Krishna is warning us not to think of them as very rare, isolated, one in a million incidents. Krishna is telling us, instructing us through these stories that these things happen commonly. Bahavogana Tapashap in the Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter. Krishna informs us that many, 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 not just one or two, but many, many, many souls by practicing Krishna consciousness have achieved liberation in the past. And if you didn't get it in this life, whatever gains and advancement you've made, that is a permanent asset in your bank account. We see that from the story of the Kumaras, from the story of Narada Muni, from the story of Ajamil, from the story of Gajendra, over and over and over and over, we are, we're illustrated. This point is underlined that everything that you've done in the past stands you in good stead. You never know at what level of advancement you are until Krishna brings it to light and Krishna reveals it. We read about the um, Kaliya serpent. Krishna, uh, he killed, uh, he, he tried to kill uh, Krishna's best friend and pollute Krishna's own uh, confidential spiritual retreat area, Vrindavan. And, uh, and yet Krishna put his lotus feet on the heads of the many heads of Kaliya, blessed him. Who could possibly imagine that a poison spewing, fire breathing snake could possibly be eligible for the special mercy of the Lord? But it's all there and it's all possible, and we can take advantage of it and make our lives successful. Kale, doshe, nidhe, rajan, astihe, kadgana, kirtan, yadi, vikrishna, mukta, sangha, param, vaja. Everywhere it's indicated that all you have to hang your hat on, all you have to worry about, in this age, is just sincerely and heartfeltly calling out the name of Krishna. That's all Gajendra did. He plucked from the muck of the lake a lotus flower and offered it, seeking the Lord's power. He stopped pulling his leg, which the croc wanted to devour, and he plucked from the muck of the lake a lotus flower, seeking the Lord's power. Krishna, the root of creation, the fruit of the Vedas, the absolute truth, the place upon your flute, the ever-existing youth, your lotus feet are adored by Lord Brahma and Shiva will never leave you, not even for a beat. Your features are unlimited, you're the greedy of all creatures. <clears throat> Whether they have hands, claws, jaws, or paws, they are all your parts and parcels. Those who are smart engage in your devotional service with all their hearts. You guard those who never depart from the shelter of your breast. <clears throat> Krishna makes it no secret of the fact that if we call out his name in times of happiness, in times of distress, in times of honor, in times of dishonor, not discriminating between the ups and downs of this material world, the favorable, the unfavorable circumstances, or between those who appear to be friendly to us and those who are to be inimical to us, but just in all circumstances and in all company, in all contexts, always, always take shelter. Think of our heads as reposing under the lotus feet of the Lord. When we come to the temple, the priest does exactly that. He puts the crown with the feet of Krishna on our heads as a form of blessing. In this age, the feet of Krishna are the syllables of the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Though this age is full of faults and full of negativities, there's hardly one of us who wasn't born in the family of meat eaters, who wasn't born of parents who drank or smoked or ate meat or ran around on each other. And yet in all of this, in the ocean of faults, which is called as Kali Yuga, there's one great advantage. That is chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. One should not take it as one amongst many processes for salvation. One should not just 
do some japa and then some yoga and then some this and some that and then the other thing. One should take shelter exclusively and wholeheartedly under the prescribed yogic practice for this age, which is chanting Hare Krishna. And if one does that, as we mentioned yesterday, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nesteva, Nesteva, Nesteva. With this fixed resolve, this fixed resolution that Krishna is my own shelter, or only shelter, and that Krishna is primarily and exclusively available in this present age in the form of his holy name. With that kind of heartfeltness, one will be able to take complete shelter of the holy name. Even in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, of sacrifices, I am japa. What does sacrifice mean? Break it down. Sacra means blessing, and facie from the Latin means doing. Sacrifice means you're, you're speaking, you're hearing, you're walking, you're talking, your very consciousness itself is immersed in sacredness, in divinity. And we achieve that. We achieve that by immersing ourselves in the name, form, pastimes, and paraphernalia and glories of the Lord. In South India, um, Lord Ram himself, when Lord Ram was in South India, he came before a Nishringa deity, the half man, half lion incarnation of Lord. And he offered his obeisances. And when we offer our obeisances, we say, Namah Vishnu, Padaya, Krishna, Pastaya, Buddha, Shrimati, Bhakti, Pinan. But when Ram bowed down before the Nishringa, he recited many names, a couple of dozen names, one after another, indicating that the name of the Lord is eternal. The name of the Lord is not different from the Lord. The name of the Lord are one's portal. The names of the Lord are one's portal of access to the Lord. So Gajendra is saying, Nama, na, na karma, na rupa, na dosha, na nama. You have no name. That means you don't have a name like we have a name. We're given a name as we assume this particular body. We are known by that name for 60 or 70 years. And then when you leave that body, the name goes away. So the name arises with this body and it departs with the departure of this body. But Krishna's, neither Krishna's name, nor his body, nor his form, nor his activities have a beginning or an end. The forms of the Lord are eternally present on his own planets in the spiritual world. They simply appear and disappear from our vision from time to time. Primitive people see the sun rising in the east and they say, oh, it's a new sun. And then they see it setting on the west and they think it's died. And what comes up the following morning is a new sun. And a new sun, every sunrise is a new sun appearing. That's not a case. It's the same sun. But when we say appearing and disappearing, we're talking from our point of view only. Actually, the sun never appears or disappears. It's always visible somewhere in the world. But when it goes out of our sight, or when it comes into our sight, we say, oh, it, it took birth, or it died, when such is not at all the case. Krishna, Nasringa, Varaha, Korma, Matsya, Ram, they're all eternally existing on their own eternal spiritual worlds. Their names are eternal. Their names are not, uh, are, don't come and go because they don't have any birth or any death. Therefore, Gajendra says, you have no name, you have no karma, you have no form, you have no activity. It means that you have no, no normal name, no normal form, no normal activities. In the next verse, the ninth verse, Gajendra refers to the activities of the Lord as ascharya. Ascharya means astonishing. I don't think anybody, if they monitored me, today or yesterday or last year or for the last decade, if they if they hung with me, uh, uh, hung over my shoulder, looked at everything I said, everything I did, everything I accomplished, um, I don't think that they would have ever been astonished. 
they might have been disappointed, they might have been disgusted, they might have been impressed on a, in a mild way, they might have been proud in, in some areas. But I don't know if astonished would ever be an adjective that would be attributed to any of my activities. And I venture to say, nor yours, nor anybody else's. So Krishna doesn't have activities like we have. Our activities are not astonishing. Our activities are humdrum, mundane, self-serving, not particularly worthy of note. I remember, I don't know what grade it was. It was in high school or prep school, rather. History. There were two, our whole history curriculum, United States history, was from two volumes, Morrison and Commenter, volume one, volume two. Each one was this thick. And the whole history class uh, <laughs> just consisted in reading and getting tested on the entire contents of Morrison and Commenter. And what was it? It was a chronological story of the United States of America. You know, from what happened in 1857, what happened in 1858, what happened in 1859, and then in 1860 and 1861, 70, just plodding along, throwing in all these facts and figures. Uh, and it wasn't the most interesting class I ever took in my life. But if you read the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's talking about pastimes. It's not talking about activities. It's talking about leelas. The difference between leela, God's leela, and our activities is our activities are whimsical or capricious, don't have any higher purpose in mind, are generally motivated by our own animalistic urges. Uh, we're just kind of like jerking, jerking around here and there, chasing something for the nose, something for the eyes, something for the ear, something to touch for six or seven years, and we die. And we do it all over again in the next life. Nothing particularly astonishing about that. It's just the pushing and pulling. It's the attraction of the senses with the external sense object. But Krishna's incarnations, Krishna's pastimes, Krishna's avatars, they perform in an astonishing way. First of all, they have complete control over their senses. Their senses are not dragging them here and there like a boat without an anchor. They're completely self-satisfied. They have nothing to gain. They have nothing to lose. The only motive behind an avatar appearing in this material world is to do good to fallen conditioned souls. And so their forms, their activities cannot be compared to ours. It's perfectly true for gender say they have no material form, no, no material names, no, no material uh, pastimes. Our activities are mundane, self-centered, animalistic, completely full of contamination. Now, if Krishna's activities were in the same category, why would, for instance, Ajamil, after chanting his name one time, get liberation from all his sins? Why is the statement made that by chanting the name of the Lord one time, one gets rid of more sins than one can commit? Why is that statement made? It's, a, it's proven to be a true statement in many cases. Why that statement is there in scripture and an infallible source of knowledge, if it were not true that Krishna is uncontaminated. Not only are the activities of Krishna uncontaminated, but if we refer in our contaminated state to Krishna's uncontaminated activities, sing his glories and pastimes, his name, and discuss, we become uncontaminated. Bahavo Jnana Tapasha. Krishna says not one or two or five or six or a hundred, but many, many souls have become uncontaminated by hearing and chanting the pastimes of the Lord. So therefore, how could he be contaminated? If he were contaminated, we would not be free from contamination by our association with him. If Ajamil had chanted Joe Biden, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, Tim Waltz, Tim Waltz, Tim Waltz, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. I doubt he would have gotten such a good result as he did. I doubt that the Yamadudas would have come and interrupted his being taken away for punishment, given him two extra years of life and another chance at redemption. 
Krishna could not be contaminated if because of chanting his name, the uncontaminated became purified. Sometimes Krishna is compared to the fire, which it exists dormantly within wood. So, the, so purity, and Krishna himself, is inside us. We have all capabilities. We're children of the Most High God. Our last name is the name of Krishna. We're part of his family. We're special, we're wonderfully, we're fearfully made. We're always blessed and never cursed. So that all is within us. Krishna's within us and Krishna's emanation, that tiny spiritual soul with whom we identify, they're all within us. They're all potentialities. The Lord of millions and millions of universes, along with one of his beloved parts and parcels, reside within our bodies in the same way that fire resides within wood. But the fire will not come out of the wood until some external manifestation of fire appears. Fire will remain within the wood for thousands and thousands of years. But when someone brings a match or a blowtorch or a flare and puts it to the wood, that will evoke the fire from within the wood to come out. So it's the external manifestation that causes the internal combustion. So similarly, when we get devotee association, uh, Krishna says, if you want to ignite your spiritual self within, and in doing so, that spiritual, spiritual flame, that spiritual fire from within is going to burn up all the inner contaminations, just like the wood which causes the fire is then burned by the fire itself. So if you want to ignite the fire within and thus igniting the fire within, burn up all the reactions of good and bad deeds for many, many past births, then you seek out the representatives of the Lord who travel the earth, canvassing, looking for fallen souls to say, uh, Ekono Bhagavana Jiva Guru Krishna Prashade Pai Bhakti Lotabish. When one finally gets fed up with this material world, gets fed up by reacting, and that's all we're doing. You know, we may flatter ourselves that we're doing this or achieving this or accomplishing this or moving forward to this. But if you're outside of Krishna consciousness, your decisions are not God driven. If you're not incorporating Krishna in your decision-making process, is this going to please Krishna or this not going to please Krishna? Is reading this book going to please Krishna or not? Is eating this food going to please Krishna or not? Is hanging around with these friends going to please Krishna or not? Now we have this month Halloween coming up. So let me ask you, is watching horror movies going to be pleasing to Krishna or not? <laughs> We're binging Halloween weekend. You binge from Thursday to Sunday. Watch one horror movie. I mean, imagine what that does to your consciousness. And imagine how turned off Krishna is going to be. So one has to consider Krishna. Krishna is who we are. He's the soul of our soul. And if we take Krishna into consideration in all of our activities and in all of our decision-making processes, then we can become free from the material contamination and thus get liberation from the cycle of birth, death, disease, and old age. That means to say that if we seek out the right association of all the decisions we make, food, books, movies, occupation, place to live, the decision who we're going to spend time with, who we're gonna take in our inner circle, and therefore, who's going to influence us the most? Whose consciousness, having spent significant amounts of time with, are going to alter my consciousness in the most significant way? That's the single most important decision that faces us as we make this journey of life. So if we decide that I'm going to associate with Vaishnavas, and what if you're living far from any community of Vaishnavas or any temple? You've got Zoom, you've got CDs, you've got digital media, you've, you've got books. You, there's every opportunity, especially in this digital technological age, to spend 
all of your free time and even your working time. During work, people are now always on their phones. They've always got their earbuds on. That wasn't always allowed, but it seems to be the standard nowadays. So take advantage. <laughs> take advantage. If I was the boss, I wouldn't want to see people on their phones or with their earphones in their ears all the time. Uh, we have one person here who works at the temple, and he's very, on very thin ice because he he's always uh, talking to people on the phone. He's always lit, lit, checking his phone. And the work that he does for the temple is not diligent. It's not conscientious. He misses a lot of things. He overlooks a lot of things. He makes a lot of mistakes. And it's all because he's he's being misled. He's allowing his consciousness to be fractured by all the digital offerings that are out there. However, if you're determined to make your connection with Krishna, you can use that same technology to be connected with Krishna. We used to say before work and after work, but now I think it's possible uh, to be connected with Krishna even during your working hours, of course. Take prasadam at lunch, bring some books, pass them out to your coworkers, try to have Krishna discussions. And when none of that's going on, just keep your earbuds on and listen to some talking. Now, Krishna consciousness is individual and it's unique. There are general practices which are recommended for everybody, chanting, taking prasadam, associating with devotees, visiting the temple on a regular basis, observing the festivals. Everybody does these things and everybody is equally benefited. But at the same time, as you advance and as you become more purified in devotional service, there'll be something particular to you that you can latch on to, that you can gravitate to. Everyone is made unique. None of us are carbon copies of any other. None of us are interchangeable. Every one of us is unique, one of a kind, a masterpiece. God created you and he stood back and he said another masterpiece. But it, some things are the same and some things differ. Think of this example, fruits. Now the math of fruits is the same. You have two apples and you add two more apples, it makes four. The four is also there if you have two mangoes and another two mangoes, that makes four. If you have two bananas and you add another two bananas, that also makes four. So any four fruits, however what you want to combine them or mix them, is going to make four. The math is the same. So there's a oneness there. There's a kind of a consistency, you might even say a monotony. But there's more than just the monotony. There's just more than just the predictability which comes from numbers and figures. There's the, there, the difference is that though the math for apples, mangoes, and oranges, and bananas may be the same, the taste of each one of those is individual. Taste of banana is different from the taste of oranges, different from the taste of mangoes, is different from the taste of apples. So similarly, although we're all encouraged to chant, to take prasadam, to associate with devotees, to visit the temple, to be part of the outreach for new people, uh, unaware people, to come to Krishna consciousness. We have a lady, middle-aged lady, originally born in Iran, two grown-up daughters, very accomplished, uh, name is Mitra. She applied to be a Wolfa volunteer a month or so ago. She came and the first couple of days, I thought she was a, a little, little uh, offhand, a little whimsical, a little kind of, I don't know. It didn't seem like she was slotting right into it, but uh, she always had a smile on her face. And I saw her working and times when the volunteers are not actually obliged to work. She's kind of a free spirit. She dresses a little flamboyantly, but she always has a big smile. And she's been here a month or so. I think she came for two weeks. She extended and she extended and extended. And every day I see her, her smile gets bigger and bigger. She's going to the morning class. She's going to the evening classes. She's chanting Japa. She's learning the prayers. She's reading the book. She's asking questions. Here is a person who just came here for whatever supercilious reasons for a couple of weeks just to experience it. And she found something valuable. She's applying herself and she's learning, enriching herself and purifying herself in the experience. But as you progress in devotional service, there are, there are things that we all do 
uh, that are all universally recommended, universally beneficial. When you uh, aspire for initiation by the spiritual master, every single spiritual perspective initiate has to follow four principles. No other sex, no gambling, no intoxication, no meeting. And they're, they're required to chant 16 rounds a day without exception. So everybody does that. And at the same time, if you do those things consistently over a sustained period of time, you're going to realize that there's something unique about you. There's a service that you can do to Krishna, which nobody else can do exactly like you. There's a contribution that you can make that nobody else can make. Now you have to, you have to do the basic training. You have to lay the groundwork. But the but the result is that you'll be you'll realize your your benefits. Take for instance learning a musical instrument. When you start out to play guitar, you're awkward. It sounds terrible. You, you don't think you'll ever be an accomplished guitarist. But the, but but if you keep at it, if you consistently practice, what happens is that which you had to force yourself to do, that which you had to do very consciously and step by step, very ploddingly. Eventually, those movements and that sense of rhythm become ingrained. They become automatic. And the more you practice, the less you have to think about what you're doing, the less it's on the mental plane, and the more it becomes reflexive and natural. And eventually, you can play if you keep at it. I read somewhere that if you spend 15 minutes a day on anything for a year, you're going to be better than 95% of the people that so if you keep at it, you will become extremely proficient. And, and then that will be your individual calling. You'll, you'll realize the thumbprint of God on you, what he made you as an individual to do by doing the general things consistently and keeping your eyes open and keeping your ears open. <clears throat> now, some say, well, I, rather than launch right now into a whole other topic, it's eight minutes past eight o'clock. Uh, we've, we've got two people here on Facebook, no one on Zoom. I won't, I'm, I'm not going to go the extra mile today. Uh, we've gone 40 minutes. And if I launch into this subject matter, it could easily take us another 20 or 30 minutes before we explore it thoroughly. So I will just put this in reserve and we'll start out next. Well, no, I'm going to Canada on Friday not traveling back till Tuesday. So probably we won't have any classes next week. And there's a chance that from my phone, I may be able to do some Zoom calls from Canada or while we're traveling by way of Detroit, but I can't promise anything. So anyway, when we gather next, we'll jump into this next subject matter, this which follows sequentially sequentially from what we've discussed today. Well, thank you very much for joining us. This is the third and final gathering of ourselves in this particular week. We had Motivational Monday, Transcendental Tuesday, Wisdom Wednesday. I believe this is the 142nd time we've revisited the past times of Kajendra, and uh, not the first and certainly not the last. <laughs> Chad and by Bobby, Hare Krishna, thank you for joining me. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare.